Good morning and welcome to this uh, act of service on the second Sunday of Epiphany. Hopefully this morning we won't be uh, dive bombed by a sparrow or a rooster. Um, there's one feeding to my right hand side and we might be dive bombed by a sheep that's fascinated by us and somebody puts its head over the divide. Uh, there's some rams on the other side there from there. I was reminded that Jesus was born in a stable and here we are in the inside of our little old barn um, up here in Tiny uh, for this act of worship today. Lord, open our lips and our mouth to proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. To us a child is born. O come, let us worship. We say the Venate together. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the caverns of the earth and the height of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he has made it. And his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and worship and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Our psalm for this morning for the Sunday worship is Psalm 139 verses 1 to 6 and then verse 13 to 18. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed me, me, formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, where none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading for this morning is taken from the first book of Samuel, and reading from chapter 3, and verses 1 to 20. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. He said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said to him, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you my son, lie down. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, 
See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be exp expatiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, I, here I am. Eli said, what is it that, you to that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Bethsheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 to 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us, us by His power. Do you know that, not know that your bodies are the member of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make the members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but a fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading for today is taken from John chapter 1, verse 43 to 51. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We have a sheep pushing up against the door alongside us. <laughs> The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said to him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Samuel was the first son of a very devoted couple, Elkanai and Hannah. Hannah struggled to have children, and in desperation she bargains with God. And if she had a son, he, she would commit him in service at the temple in Shiloh. She eventually gives birth to Samuel, heard of God, and brings him to live with Eli the priest at the tabernacle once he is weaned. While Hannah gives Samuel new robes 
robes for his role in the worshipping life of the tabernacle, he's primarily raised by this elderly priest Eli. Eli has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they've abused their position of privilege at the tabernacle. Their reputation is so bad that a prophet comes to Eli to tell him that his sons are the last of his line of his family to serve as priests. In contrast, God appears to the boy Samuel in a voice that repeats his name. Hey, buddy. Just got to salt the ram. <laughs> hey. I'll give you an opportunity to see them in a moment. <laughs> Four young rams in there and one of them is playing with the door. <laughs> in contrast, God appears to a boy, Samuel, in a voice that repeats his name. He repeatedly thinks it is Eli, but Eli eventually cottons on that it might be God who is encouraging Samuel. So he says to him, speak, for your servant is listening. Next time he hears the voice. What we then have is a confirmation of the loss of the priestly role of Eli's sons and the calling of Samuel to fulfill that role. In fact, Samuel becomes a type or picture of Christ in his service. He faithfully leads the people of Israel as the last judge and anoints the first two kings, Saul and David, of the people of Israel. He becomes the backbone of the faith during a period of incredible transformation that leads up to the great prosperity and stability of the reign of Solomon. In essence, Eli's bad news of the neglect of faith is turned into the good news of faith as God works around the given norms of Eli's day in order to bring a new message of hope to these people. In choosing Samuel, God demonstrates God's ability to create hope in a situation of profound loss. In the time of Jesus, it was an incredibly rigorous process to become a disciple of a rabbi. First, boys would be required to memorize the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, as part of their basic education. Then the cream of those boys would be encouraged to memorize the remainder of the Hebrew scriptures. Then a very small handful would then seek out a rabbi, and if they proved themselves good enough, they would be called to be a disciple. In reality, the vast majority of boys would get through the first process and then enter a family trade or business, much like Simon and Andrew, or Philip and Nathaniel, who went to work with their respective fathers in the fishing industry. Jesus first encounters Philip and calls him to become a disciple. Philip, now so enthusiastic about this rabbi called Jesus, he calls relatively unlearned to become his disciples. He introduces him to his brother Nathaniel. Now these fishermen are from Bethsaida, literally House of Nets, a really rough small fishing town on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It is so rough and ungodly that Matthew records Jesus cursing it for its wickedness. And Christ is so disparaging of it that he suggests that there is more faith in the Gentile seaside towns of Tyre and Sidon than there is in Bethsaida. What now follows in John's Gospel is an interaction between Jesus and Nathanael that we could, re could read in a number of ways. One option is to read it as a very humorous interchange that plays on a rivalry between these two slum towns, one rural and one coastal, of Naz Nazareth and Bethsaida. Another would be to see it as a true affirmation of Nathanael's strong religious conviction and knowledge, pop possibly as one shun from being called a disciple in spite of his incredible knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures. So we might assume that when Nathaniel hears that this rabbi called Jesus is from the rural slum called Nazareth, he sees it as being even more despicable than his own hometown of Bethsaida. We might assume that Jesus responds to him, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, is actually a humorous rebuttal to Nathaniel's prejudice. Another way of reading this interchange is to see Nathaniel as a man who desires to be called a disciple of a rabbi, but was turned down. He has a good understanding of the prophetic idea that the Messiah was to be born from the city of David, of Bethlehem, and that Philip's assertion that Jesus was from Nazareth did not match his knowledge of the scriptures. 
Jesus' response to him is not a rebuttal, but an affirmation of his desire to follow the true Messiah. The one is to be the fulfillment of the hope of Israel. God, yet again, sidesteps the given order of things to continue to reach out to humanity in new ways. As God sidestepped the priestly class in calling Samuel, Jesus sidestepped the usual rabbinic process in order to call the uneducated from the rural and industrial slums of his day to proclaim the good news that God is at work in our world. That God has not missed these folk even if they might feel neglected. God is actively at work, constantly extending the reach of the Kingdom of God to new communities and to the margins of society. For in Christ, not only does God extend that Kingdom to these uneducated men, but to women and children who are at the bottom of the social heap in Jesus' day. And then through them, to those outside the faith, namely the Gentiles, who we remember in Epiphany. God is constantly finding new ways to increase the circle in a way that affirms the understanding that God knows us and calls us afresh in new ways in our time. Pray God that we, when we feel isolated and wonder if God is at work around us, that we may see that God is constantly working in, un in unexpected ways, even if it means sidestepping the obvious and given ways of doing things and working around what we might have thought was a solution. And we might feel we are on the very margins of what God might be interested in doing, that we may realize that God constantly extends God's compassion and grace to those who are at the margins. Amen. We say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning we use litany number 13, litany of incarnation, for our prayers. In joy and humility, let us pray to the creator of the universe, saying, Lord, grant us peace. By the good news of our salvation brought to Mary by the angel, hear us, O Lord. Lord, grant us peace. By the mystery of the word made flesh, hear us, O Lord. Lord, grant us peace. By the birth in time of this timeless Son of God, hear us, O Lord. Lord, grant us peace. By the manifestation of the King of Glory to the Shepherds and Magi, hear us, O Lord. Lord, grant us peace. By the submission of the Maker of the world to Mary and Joseph of Nazareth, hear us, O Lord. Lord, grant us peace. By the baptism of the Son of God in the River Jordan, Hear us, O Lord. Lord, grant us peace. God of grace, today we pray for our church. We pray for Bishop Andrew and for Bishop Priscilla, who is uh, our acting um, and uh, functioning, sorry, <laughs> um, bishop, area bishop at the moment. We pray for ourselves as a parish of St. Margaret of Scotland. We pray that we would be faithful to the calling that you've placed on our life in our time. We pray for our broader community. We pray for folk now in the midst of this uh, state of emergency here in Ontario. That we would be kept safe and guarded in this time. We pray for those on our hearts and minds. Those known to us and those not known to us those who are isolated and lonely, and those who have been kept away from family and friends. We pray for those in hospital, those infected with this virus, and those treating them and caring for them. We pray particularly for those in nursing homes in the midst of this pandemic, that they may be kept safe. We pray for ourselves, 
that in our most moments of isolation, we may recognize your hand at work, that you are still active in our world, seeking new ways to engage us in faith. Grant us the faith to see you at work. We pray, grant that the kingdoms of this world may become the kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Hear us, O Lord. Lord, grant us peace. We pray the collect for the good day. Almighty God, your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word and sacrament, shine with the radiance of his glory, that we may be known, worshipped and obeyed to the ends of the earth, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> In the midst of the prayers, we were invaded by a small gang of roosters. Uh, this, one, this one sitting on a doorpost. <laughs> And there's a small clutch of them down there feeding and some more up there. <laughs> and there's another one over there. <laughs> anyway, they decided to join us in the midst of the prayers. <laughs> just a few notices, just a reminder, this coming Thursday we start our Bible study on Philippians at 7.30 in the evening through Zoom. And please join us for those four weeks of study uh, together. In the midst of this uh, state of emergency, we've uh, needed to shut the office and everybody is being required to work remotely and from home. Which means that uh, at the end of the day, um, we're having to pop in to check the mail and to check on messages and so on. And all of the services from here on in will be recorded um, from home, from here on the farm. <laughs> so, Hopefully that will not be as rowdy as the one is today, but uh, we'll have to see. Um, just being dive bombed by another rooster on the way out, and they're all deciding to crow at the same time. We have a clutch of roosters, by the way. Um, anybody want a rooster? Uh, free going from here. <laughs> The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine us on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favour and grant us peace. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest with you now and forevermore. Amen. I'm reminded yet again that I don't think Jesus' birth was a quiet moment in history. Um, if he was in a barn, anything like this, um, there was a lot of noise uh, going on at once. I'm just going to show you a little group of rams that we have and uh, uh, we have five of them directly behind me here one of them is an old guy called apricot and uh, he's a great old ram he looks after everybody else um, he is with the young rams and looking after them and keeping them in place and he's an old guy and uh, definitely is going to live out the last of his days here on the farm um, he's really great because he looks after all the lambs that uh, are born in the spring and um, he really guards them so uh, he makes when they go out to pasture that none of them left behind um, in the paddock but all go out and in the evenings when we go and fetch them and bring them back to the barn he's the last one to come in he he does the scout of the field and makes sure that everybody's rounded up uh, and comes in with him um, he's incredibly uh, faithful old ram and a, a great look after of things uh, which you're much pleased of in addition we have four young rams behind me i'll show you them now and uh, at some point we're going to have to select out which ones we use for breeding um, from here. But there's old Apricot. Good old faithful that he is. And there's a bunch of young rams on the other side there. Um, Mr. The rooster and uh, they're just doing their sweet thing as best they can from there. 
I'll try and zoom in on that by the way. There we are. There they are, a little bit more. That's a great old guy. They actually have uh, cattle tags on their ears um, because the farmer who owned them before us, we bought them as young lambs, um, he didn't have sheep tags, so he put cattle tags on them. Um, and then that's removed at some point. <laughs> and the old guy, Apricot, there he is. Just gonna go see that everything's okay. And these are the roosters, by the way. Um, they're not small in any shape or form. And uh, <laughs> they separated out from the hens um, and uh, they just basically occupy the barn as best they can. Again, thank you very much for being with us this Sunday and we pray for God's richest blessing upon you as you go into the week. Amen.